Greetings, discerning scholars and astute skeptics of Middle-earth. What a spectacle today's meeting of the White Council proved to be. Imagine, if you will, the audacity to claim that Sauron himself is prancing around Dol Guldor as if it's some dark holiday retreat. There I stood, Saruman the Wise, Saruman of many colors, whose counsel has steered this meandering collective from disaster time and again. And how do they repay such unparalleled sagacity with the kind of skepticism and scrutiny more appropriately directed at a mischievous child caught with his hand in the cookie jar, not the supreme architect of Isengard. Mother! Lady Galadriel's handed us these enchanted biscuits, and by the gods, they're magical. They're even tastier than Elrond's, if you can stomach that thought. Let's set the record straight. Respect is not some trifling nicety. It's my due, a sacred tribute to the brilliance that I, and I alone, bring to our little soirees. I'm not here to be prodded and poked like some common riddlemonger at a country fair. I am the linchpin of this council, the unmatched mind whose strategies keep the night at bay. When I speak, it should send ripples of solemn agreement through the room, not the murmured chuckles of the incredulous. Today's charade was a disgrace, a farce wrapped in the thin veneer of council protocol, an insult not just to my person, but to the esteemed office I hold. To have my motives picked apart, my insights second-guessed, as though I were a green apprentice who had wandered in from the rain. As we peel back the layers of the narratives herein, it is vital, no, essential, that we approach what's been spun into the so-called historical tapestry with a critical eye. Let's just say, take every word with a grain of salt, hefty enough to rival the hills of Emin Mühl. These tales, draped in the cloak of pressing doom and prophetic urgency, are bound to elicit a collective eye roll and would be right at home on the stage of the Rivendell Comedy Club. So, ready your intellectual shields and draw the swords of your discerning judgment as we venture into this tangled web of so-called facts. Remember, in the realm of wizardly tales, not every shadow hides a monster. Sometimes it's just a shadow, and not every eloquent tale of terror is a glimpse into truth. Let's begin this journey, shall we? And let's do so with a smirk, for the narratives ahead are as reliable as the roads of Mirkwood. Just one more thing. As you grow weary of juvenile stories, I urge you to not be idly twiddling your thumbs as I lay bare the true historical account of Mirkwood not some fanciful tale of enchanted shrubbery and such like. Can I expect you there, sharp and unclouded by the muddle of wine or the frivolous allure of merry tunes? Right then, you've had your say, old wizard. Now kindly take your seat and let the real narration begin. We promise to keep it light.
As the events unfolded in the ancient annals of Middle-earth during the Third Age, Gandalf the Grey's persistent investigations and astute observations led to an irrefutable revelation. The malevolent being ensconced in Dol Guldur was none other than the Dark Lord Sauron, mastermind of old and harbinger of immeasurable darkness. The revelation of Sauron's return sent shockwaves through the esteemed chambers of the White Council. A gathering of wise and powerful beings, such as Saruman the White, Elrond Half-Elven, and Galadriel of Lothlorien. However, rather than being immediately accepted, Gandalf's conclusions faced thorough skepticism as Saruman voiced his doubts. Sauron, returning in such secrecy? Saruman's voice echoed with a hint of disbelief, his piercing eyes fixed on Gandalf. Are you certain of this, Gandalf? The consequences of such claims could plunge Middle-earth into darkness once more. Gandalf's frustration boiled over as he stood before the White Council. His eyes narrowed in a rare display of irritation, directed squarely at Saruman, the head of the Council. Saruman, have you not felt the whispers of malice in the air, the subtle shifts in power? The Dark Lord's return may be cloaked under a disguise, but the signs cannot be mistaken. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it would seem that this so-called necromancer is fooling no one but you, Saruman. Gandalf continued, his voice carrying a sharp edge that cut through the Council Chamber's solemn atmosphere. I confess, my patience wears thin in the face of our collective complacency. Forgive my bluntness, but I must ask, have our once keen-eyed spies suddenly lost their sight? Or have they succumbed to the same lethargy that seems to grip this council? How is it that our intelligence has faltered to such a degree that we remain blind to the growing peril festering in our very midst? His words hung in the air, heavy with reproach, yet tinged with a grim urgency that demanded attention. Gandalf's gaze lingered pointedly on Saruman, his disappointment palpable as he singled out the Astari, known for his wisdom and foresight. Saruman, do you take me for a fool? I once revered you for your wisdom and foresight, now all I see is arrogance masquerading as ignorance. Nearly a century has passed since I entrusted you with my detailed report on Dol Guldur's burgeoning darkness. I stood within those haunted halls, witnessed firsthand the festering sickness that seeped out of that forsaken fortress atop Amon Lank, like a poisoned wound infecting its surroundings. Hmm. The secrets of Mirkwood. What could they possibly entail? Knowledge hidden within the shadows, veiled by the ancient trees. But the Necromancer and Dol Guldur. If these words hold truth, it becomes clear that neither the Black Easterling nor the Captain of Despair holds dominion over that ominous hill. If not them, then who? Hmm. Yes, indeed. This is all profoundly intriguing. Within a shroud of shadows, he has woven layers of secrecy, shielding both his identity and his influence. Evading the scrutiny of our agents for centuries on end is truly remarkable. If it wasn't for this... report, I would never think it possible. Yet again, the darkness seems to be mutating. 
It is trying to mimic the forces of light. Or it is simply changing itself to withstand the light. I really can't tell. Could it actually invert life itself? I feel strangely inspired. Saruman's gaze flickered. With a mixture of defiance and uncertainty, he absorbed Gandalf's vehement accusations. Elrond, sitting amongst the members of the White Council, observed the exchange with a furrowed brow, his mind grappling with the weight of Gandalf's words. Saruman, surely you can understand Gandalf's concern. The matter of Dol Guldur and the Necromancer has troubled many minds, yet the silence from our agents remains deafening. It is peculiar. As tension simmered in the council chamber, Galadriel, adorned in her ethereal grace, straightened her dress and stood up. Her piercing eyes had surveyed the heated exchange between the two wizards with a thoughtful gaze. Gandalf speaks with conviction, and his concerns cannot be dismissed. Galadriel's gaze turned towards Gandalf, her eyes now alight with a subtle intensity that bespoke her curiosity and concern. With a graceful motion, she inclined her head towards the Grey Wizard, her voice a gentle yet probing inquiry that cut through the lingering silence. Gandalf, you spoke of a report regarding Dol Guldur that you entrusted to Saruman a long time ago. Can you shed more light on its contents? What really did happen to you in that menacing fortress? Galadriel's words hung in the air, drawing the attention of the council members as they awaited Gandalf's response. In the stillness of the chamber, her inquiry served as a beacon of clarity amidst the shadows of uncertainty. Yes, my lady Galadriel, Gandalf replied, his voice measured yet slightly tinged with surprise. The report provides a detailed account of my time within Dol Guldur. The fortress, more akin to a sprawling city, is a labyrinth of twisting corridors and shadowed chambers. I found myself navigating its depths with trepidation, each step fraught with peril. As Gandalf continued his narrative of traversing the dark, cavernous castle, his words wove a haunting tale, effortlessly ensnaring the undivided attention of his audience. Each council member hung on his every word, drawn deeper into the unfolding saga of his trials and tribulations. Gandalf edged deeper into the bowels of the fortress, every sense strained to its limit. Eventually, he came upon a scene he could never have anticipated. The walls, once a canvas of monotony and despair, now bore an insidious tinge of green. What caught his eye, though, was the unusual vegetation. This was not your garden variety greenery. It burst through the floor's crevices. With a life of its own, its threads shimmering and pulsing, as if mocking the very concept of death that pervaded this place. Of all the accursed locations in Middle-earth, where terror should have reigned supreme, life chose this very spot to spring forth, daring to assert itself in a powerful burst of vitality. Hmm. Life in this forsaken abode. Gandalf murmured, his voice filled with disgust. He stepped closer to the wall, his movement barely making a sound as he leaned in to examine the moss. Crafty work, necromancer. Crafty work indeed. But what is your game? What foul purpose does this serve? His voice was a low growl, barely more than a whisper, yet it carried the power of his formidable presence. The response was not verbal, 
but visceral. The vegetation pulsed more vigorously, as if acknowledging the wizard's inquiry. Around him, the silence was oppressive, broken only by the soft crackling from the expanding greenery. It was as if the air itself held its breath, waiting for some dreadful outcome. Paralysis gripped him, not of the body, but of the mind. Movement was an idea lost to the mire of his tumultuous thoughts, leaving him rooted to the spot. This is but another test, he affirmed, the inner monologue steadying his spiraling mind. A puzzle laid by the enemy, perhaps, but one I must solve, for in the heart of confusion lies the truth, veiled and elusive. There he stood, a lone sentinel against the unknown, a beacon of resistance within the darkness that sought to drown him. Just as Gandalf was poised to unveil a critical twist in his tail, another voice cleaved through the chamber, slashing the tense moment with a blade of palpable contempt. I have better things to do than to listen to the ramblings of an old wizard. Saruman's voice, cold and imperious, drawed startled looks from the assembly. I must leave you now lest I be late for my appointed introductory lecture to Greenwood the Great in the halls of arcane studies. The room fell into an uneasy silence. Saruman's eyes, hard and unyielding, briefly met Gandalf's, sending a clear message of dismissal and derision before turning sharply on his heel. Esteemed scholars and hardened veterans of arcane study, I am Saruman the White, the voice of Isengard, head of the Order of Wizards and the guiding hand of the White Council. We gather under the grim shadows of history today, not to indulge in idle tales, but to carve through the darkness into the heart of Mirkwood's haunted past with the precision of a scholarly blade. But let us tread cautiously, so I urge you to approach this lecture with a clear mind, unswayed by the often fanciful tales of our fellow wizard, Gandalf the Grey. His accounts, though spirited, may not always align with the rigor of scholarly inquiry we aspire to uphold here. Our voyage will span the ages, from the starlit era of Greenwood the Great to its transformation into the ominous Mirkwood, a domain shadowed by the creeping malice of Dol Guldur. We'll explore the dominion of its elven lords, the legacy of the Sylvan Elves, and the pivotal sagas that have etched deep scars across its storied landscape. Once named Greenwood the Great, this sprawling forest might have been a remnant of the ancient woods that shrouded much of Middle-earth during the years of the trees, perhaps even stretching an arm across the Anduin to touch Lothlorien. The Eldar, on their grand march to Valinor, trod through its expanse, and it was here that the Nandor, eschewing the daunting misty mountains, chose to settle, nestled in the forested embrace of the Anduin's valleys. They thrived their numbers swelling. Over time, 
they were joined by the itinerant Avari, and together these elves, bound by their love for the shadowed woods, came to be known as the Sylvan or Wood Elves, a people as much a part of the forest as the ancient trees themselves. The old forest road, hewn from the dark heart of Greenwood in its earliest days, was the work of the Longbeard Dwarves. They forged this path to bridge their mighty holds in the misty mountains with Erebor and the distant Iron Hills, crafting a lifeline of stone and resolve. Yet, as the shadows lengthened, this road fell to ruin, forsaken and forgotten when the foul orcs of the misty and grey mountains seized Gundabad, severing the once sturdy links between Khazad-dum and its brethren realms of the Iron Hills and Erebor. The road, once a vein of trade and tales, became a mere whisper of history choked by the creeping malice that divided dwarf from dwarf. Around the year 750 of the Second Age, the Cinder Prince, Orifer, wearied by the polished courts of Linden, ventured into the wilds of Greenwood. There, amid the ancient shadows and whispering leaves, he found the Sylvan Elves, spirits of wood and leaf of Nandor descent mingled with the wandering Avari. They were a rough-hewn folk, unpolished but fierce, who saw in him a leader, sharp as their flint-tipped arrows. Master Saruman, excuse me. A melodious voice rang out, silencing the murmurs of the assembly. All eyes turned to the figure garbed in colourful, flamboyant robes that shimmered with an almost magical luminescence. May I ask a question? Saruman's gaze lifted sharply. His eyes swept over the gathered audience, his expression one of slight annoyance at this interruption of his grand tale. And you are? Ah, within these hallowed walls, my title or lineage counts for naught. I stand here merely as a seeker of wisdom, humble and unadorned. I know about Prince Orifer's adoption of Sylvan customs and his withdrawal into isolation, but could you elaborate on how his leadership specifically influenced the military strategies of the Woodland Realm? Given his background, from the more structured Sindarin military, did he implement any of those tactics among the Sylvan Elves, or did he fully embrace their guerrilla warfare style? Ah, a sharp question that cuts to the heart of it. Orifer wasn't just carting old Cinderin tricks up his sleeve. No, he had a whole arsenal of them. But he wasn't a fool to march blind into Greenwood with banners waving. He saw right quick the cunning in the Sylvan Elves' own ways. Their love for a good ambush and the sneaky joy they got from a well-placed arrow from the shadows. He didn't exactly throw out their playbook, but inked in a few pages of his own. Cinderin discipline, battle formations that could turn a rabble into a shield wall, drills that could make even the laziest elf shoot straight in his sleep. He wove their woodland guerrilla warfare with his structured military brain, crafting a deadly dance of stealth and order. Orifer would carve his realm in the heart of that twilight forest, setting his throne upon Armin Lank's haunted hill. At the dawn of the Third Age, Thranduil took up the crown in the woodland realm stepping into the void left by Orifer, 
who had been slain in the Battle of Dargorlad. Likely, it was the grim toll of this Battle of Dargorlad that thinned their numbers. The Sylvan Elves, once scattered broad across Greenwood, now huddled in the shadowy folds of the Emin Dwyer. As the centuries wore on, a chill crept through the forest. By the second millennium, Amon Lank, in Greenwood's southern reaches, saw the rise of a foul presence. There, amidst whispers and dread, a newly constructed stronghold known as Dol Guldur rose stark against the sky, a pit of sorcery, a den of darkness. This architect of misery was none other than the infamous Necromancer, a dark presence of formidable power. From his cursed tower, a blight spread like spilled ink across the verdant woodlands. Mirroring the ancient decay he wrought upon the highland forests of Dorthonian in the forgotten First Age. That land, too, had succumbed to his venomous shadow, once named Tor Nu Fwin, the forest under a nightshade pool. Henceforth, the elves whispered it anew. Mirkwood, a name that bore the stain of blood magic, a reminder of the despair that had once again found root in their world, a despair that turned a forest once bright into a labyrinth of gloom and fear. In the 17th century, right about the time the Great Plague was cutting through Gondor and Eriador like a scythe, the darkness in Greenwood deepened into something downright sinister. The burgeoning malice wasn't content with mere whispers. It bellowed trouble from the treetops. Fortunately, it was enough to snag the sharp gaze of the wise, dragging Gandalf right through the dark damned doors of that fortress in the year 2063, all fiery and hell-bent on rooting out this necromancer. But when he barged in, the place was as empty as promises in a pauper's will, no sign of the necromancer, no hint he'd ever skulked there at all. Empty. It's like the hollow laugh of a dead man, isn't it? As still and silent as the eye of a storm, mocking me with its bloody calm, have I really dragged myself through hell for nothing but phantoms and dust? Odd, that. Yet, as soon as Gandalf's boots hit the ground, it's as if the light got the memo. Sunshine began to gently peer through the thick canopy, particularly around Dol Guldur. In the following era, the ten ruling stewards of Gondor carved out a time of strained peace. Mardil Voronwë led the line, followed by hard men like Eridan, Herion, and the others. Belagorn, through to Denethor Thirst, each with a hand firmer than the last. They patched up their borders, eyes forever scanning the east where stains like Minas Morgul loomed like dark promises, and Mordor crawled with its foul denizens. Yet, 
save for the odd clash spilling over from the pirate haunts of Umba, the great escalations held their breath. Out in the now sparse forts of Kalanadon, where the great plague had left ghost towns, the banners of Gondor faded, forgotten. Local chieftains, leading a mixed blood populace, grabbed the reins, marking a slow, silent shift in power. To the north, Eriador lay in a deceptive hut. Trolls that once hailed from Angmar now skulked in the shadows east of the Misty Mountains, their threat a dull ache in the land's memory. The Shire saw better days. Hobbits thrived, spread, and for the first time, chose a tale in lieu of a king. Bucca, stepping up, followed by the likes of Isumbras, took Buckland too came alive under the old bucks. Ah, the Green Dragon Inn, a murky well of ale and idle hobbit chatter. You'd be hard-pressed to find a more raucous corner of mischief in all the Shire. It's there they plot. Not with any grand ambition, you understand. No, nothing as lofty as the dominions of men and elves. Instead, they scheme over their next meal and potential pie raids. Each pint serving as fuel for their next grand, albeit tiny, adventure. Their little eyes, alight with petty rebellion against the sobriety of the dawn. Don't let the laughter and the lilting tunes fool you. Where there's smoke, there's fire, and where there's ale. There's a hobbit up to no good. Four centuries rolled by in that deceiving calm before the darkness came crashing back. Muscle and malice bulked up to bursting. Before we proceed, however, I want to turn your attention to a lesser known yet illustratively dismal chapter in the history of Mirkwood, the petty squabbles of its goblin inhabitants. Imagine, if you will, a scene playing out in the depths of that dark forest, in a cave barely lit by the grim fire at its heart. Here we find three goblins, Groobnash, Snarltooth, and Scabnose, each as dim-witted as the other, their minds as stunted as the stumpy legs they stand on. Grubnash, a creature so sullied by filth that he might be mistaken for an ambulatory heap of mud, shouts at Snarltooth. You brainless dollop of troll snot. I said to feed the fire. Not poison us all with the stench of your rotting boot. Snarltooth, whose hygiene habits are as questionable as his intellect, retorts with the sort of logic one might expect from a goblin. And I've been telling you, Grubna, these boots are as wooden as your head. Been gnawing on them last three nights, haven't I? Adds flavor to the fire. It does. 
The third, Scabnose laughs, a sound akin to gravel, scraping across a tombstone as he adds, Boy, that's rich. Now we're breathing in the ripe essence of Snarltooth's feet. Might as well keel over and die now. Save the elves the trouble. The discourse continues in this vein, with Grubnash hurling the charred remains of the boot at Snarltooth, marking his face with a blackened smear that might be considered an improvement to his usual visage. Snarltooth complains absurdly that this was his fighting boot, the best of his pair, to which Scabnose mockingly crowns it, the less chewed one. Their bickering is relentless. The insults fly thick and fast, much like the arrows in a more noble battle. Grubnash finally attempts to steer the conversation to their supposed purpose in these woods. Elf hunting. Enough jawing. We've got elf hunting to plan, not sit here roasting each other's footgear. Though roasting Snarltooth might be the only way to clean him, he declares, proving once again that strategy among goblins is as poorly developed as their personal grooming. Let this scene be a reminder to you all of the diversity existing within Mirkwood's bounds. Not all that dwells within is as noble as the elves or as fearsome as the spiders. Some, like our goblin friends here, contribute little more than farce to the tapestry of this ancient woodland. By the days of Syrian, around the start of the 26th century of the Third Age, Dol Guldur wasn't just a festering sore in the woods, it was a stronghold of the worst sort. The Baukoth, Easterlings with hearts as dark as their lord's intentions, came under its sway. These weren't your average marauders. They tore through Mirkwood, slashing their way up to the Vales of Anduin, leaving them ghostly quiet until they got their backsides handed to them. However, the Necromancer's homecoming party was a real kick in the teeth, and it darkened Greenwood for good. What was once just a deep, dark wood got a new name. Mirkwood, a place where nightmares didn't just visit, they moved in for good. The offspring of Shelob, those giant spiders, took up residence alongside bats and orcs, all on the necromancer's payroll. They turned the forest into a den of gloom, thick with webs and thicker with dread. When the situation grew too dire, Thranduil had enough. He took his Sylvan folk and pushed north, past the forest river, seeking respite from the darkening skies. They hunkered down, mostly holed up in the Elven King's halls at the forest's river-bound edge about as cozy as you can get, with death breathing down your neck. What about the old forest road, I hear you ask? Abandoned, left to ghosts and whispers. 
men and dwarves weren't fool enough to tread that cursed path anymore. They skirted further from Dol Guldur, near the forest's eastern edge, while the hobbits, bless their hearts, didn't stick around to see how the story ended. Today, Mirkwood remains a no-man's land, a spine-chilling expanse where fear reigns supreme, even as Erebor and Dale hit a streak of luck under the kings under the mountain. But like all good things, that too crumbled to dust when Smaug came crashing down, laying waste to the northeast like a nightmare come alive. And let's not forget the woodmen, scrabbling out a meager existence on the forest's western fringes, living under constant threat from ancient terrors and newer horrors alike. The charming life of the woodmen, eh? Living day to day with the constant joy of knowing that any minute could be your last, thanks to the local wildlife or a rogue goblin or two. It's enough to make anyone's heart leap into a full stop. If stress were a dragon, folks, it'd be winging its way north as we speak, looking to turn heart strings into harp strings. Indeed, one could argue that living in such exciting times might just be the secret to an invigoratingly short life. And thus, Dear aspiring wizards and not-so-gentle scholars, we conclude today's excursion into the dim and misty paths of Mirkwood. Remember, while the histories of Middle-earth brim with courage and darkness alike, they also serve to remind us of the eternal dance of light and shadow, hope and despair. We learn not only to navigate the treacherous terrains of ancient forests, but also the more perilous realms of knowledge and power. So, take heed from today's lessons. Arm yourselves well, not just with spells and enchantments, but with the sharp blade of wit and the sturdy shield of insight. For in the end, it is our wisdom that defines us, far more than the raw power at our command. And finally, should you ever find yourself facing the metaphorical dragons of your own studies, may your heartstrings resonate with courage and not snap from the sheer terror of academic deadlines. <laughs>